Well, welcome everybody. It's great to be with you this evening. I want to thank you for being here tonight. It's a uh, it's getting warm, actually, out there. I got pretty hot this afternoon, but it's still beautiful uh, to be outside. And um, what was even more beautiful is hearing the laughter down the hallway as I came in. It's just really sweet to know that everybody is getting back to church. And um, So I just uh, appreciate you being here this evening. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into the material tonight. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about packing for heaven. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for protecting us and watching over us so well. We pray, dear Lord, for your will to be done tonight as we look to your word together. It's a great privilege that we have the Bible, and it's an even greater privilege that we have the Holy Spirit to help us understand it. Lord, thank you for your word. Please guide us now as we look to it for help. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've been talking about some extracurricular topics, things that we certainly discussed in the Revelation series, but I just wanted to take a little more time and kind of dive a little deeper into the subjects. And yesterday, well, I should say last time, last Wednesday, we actually discussed the idea of setting our mind on heaven, okay? It's a New Testament commandment. You are supposed to have your mind set on heaven. It's an imperative. And so um, we talked about that. And sometimes it's just something that I don't really see that often. Um, but even in my own life, I, I wish I could cultivate that more. Uh, I think this is really relevant, uh, especially in the past year and a half, as we've seen all types of things uh, in our country, around the world. Uh, you don't have to talk with anybody for any amount of time before you, you find something that someone's discouraged about or concerned about or stressed about, or, you know, it gets even worse from that. Anger, lots and lots of anger. And uh, anger usually comes from a place of despair where you feel like you can't do anything about any, a, a change, and so you're kind of a bystander. Uh, at least in some instances, that's really the, the kind of the birth of anger. And so uh, I hope this, this will encourage you tonight as we, we think about, you know, really what, we're, what, what are we supposed to do here on this side of heaven? Have you ever thought about that, uh, the idea? It's like, in, is what I did today actually preparing me for heaven? Is there something happening? You know, most of you have grown in the faith quite a bit through the years by studying the Bible. You understand that God, his, your salvation is really His craftsmanship. He is just as responsible for your faith and your growing in faith, your, your glorification ultimately, Every part, right, justifies you by the blood of Christ. He gives you his righteousness. He sanctifies you by the Holy Spirit and by the word of God and by the church. And that's what's happening. We're, we're being changed, we're being molded. He even takes the bad things in our life and uses them as great lessons and teachers. And of course, he promises that he's going to present us before the Father with great joy, blameless with great joy, mind you, which is a spectacular promise, one that is up to him, not us. And that's a wonderful comfort. But in a real sense, that means that God's preparing us for heaven. That, that this journey we're on in life, this preparation, He's, he's sanctifying us and he's, he's working on us. And you know, we don't know if today will be the end of that journey or the next chapter of that journey. But uh, certainly it's something that can at least spur on some meditation, some thought life about Hey, God's up to something in my life. He's, he's working behind the scenes every day. He's working on me. He's helping me grow my faith and my understanding. So we're going to ask that question tonight. The first thing that I, I thought is really pertinent, especially for some others who may have come across this Bible study, is, is the question, am I ready for heaven? And, you know, I just want to encourage you to ask people that. Uh, usually, if you talk with someone long enough to get past the first five minutes of pleasantries, it doesn't take long before something's going to come up that proves to you that they live in the same fallen world that you do. Yeah, my uncle died last month, or um, you know, my 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 mom just been diagnosed with a serious illness. It, it, 
it doesn't matter who you talk to, it's going to come up. And that's the perfect bridge for discussing where they are in their worldview. You know, that's, that's really tough. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, you know, what, what type of uh, philosophy do you live by? Do you, do you believe there's going to be an afterlife? Uh, you know, that's such a tough, tough subject. You can empathize with them, but still in an open, gracious way, kind of bring up the subject of, of death and what happens after death. And, and I just think it's, it's always a regular opportunity to turn a conversation towards just simply you sharing what you believe. And there's a way to have openness in uh, conversation. Even in the military, in uh, some of the professional military education that we're required to do as we promote, uh, they talk to us about cross-cultural negotiations, right? And how you're supposed to have an openness when you discuss things with others. And that's really what's kind of been forgotten in the world lately. That you can actually talk to somebody without agreeing with them. So almost like now... Uh, we feel like as soon as we hear something we don't like, we can't continue the conversation. But of course, you're trying to be open and gracious, and uh, just think about that next time you get in a conversation with someone. Listen to this text, Hebrews 9, 24 through 26. For Christ has entered the holy, uh, excuse me, has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When you have to ask yourself this question, am I ready for heaven? The only legitimate answer that you can have security and assurance in is uh, the alien righteousness of Christ. And this amazing passage is describing exactly how Jesus was that all-sufficient sacrifice. And again, he compares it, how, he's basically saying, look how, mu how more superior Christ's sacrifice is compared to the Old Testament sacrifices. And he's talking about the high priest there. You know, this wasn't just an annual sacrifice, or else Jesus would have to be dying every year forever. This was a once and for all. And I love it that it says that Jesus is in heaven itself right now. And so, really, uh, one of the ways to understand assurance of salvation is to know what's been offered for you. And I meet a lot of people, even in the church, and, you know, they just struggle at times, and they say, well, you know, I just, I've had a lot of failures in my life, and I, I, I did some things that I'm ashamed to talk about back then, and, or, you know, last year, and I just, I'm not so sure that God's going to have a place for me in heaven. And I've been surprised at times, the people who I come across that actually, they're struggling with that. But I want you to always remember that your assurance of heaven is never about your performance. It's always about the superior uh, superiority of the sacrifice that was given for you. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have real evidence in your life of a transformation and a change. And a, At best, you should have a real problem when you sin. It's called conviction. And the Holy Spirit's going to beat you around and make you know that you've sinned against God. But, you know, so, so often I think people kind of fall back into a kind of a workspace mentality where they have to earn God's favor. And because they know they really have shortcomings, well, that leaves them in doubt. Well, I, I always know that that happened, and I can't get away. I can't undo that. And so then they start experiencing doubts for their salvation that the Bible says you shouldn't be doubting. You should know. John says, I write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life, right? So just always remember that. It's always because of the precious, priceless sacrifice that was given for you, not because of your works. Now, we're going to be looking at this in great detail when we begin back in Genesis. And we're going to find out that all of religion is a man-made attempt to, to literally cover the past. But Christian doctrine and the gospel is absolutely opposite of that. Every man-made religion is about a system to cover the faults of the past. Christianity is the opposite of that. 
It's about accepting something that you can't do on your behalf. And that, of course, is what Jesus did on the cross. You trust in that. And uh, that's really the way to be ready for heaven. That's the only way to be ready for heaven. Here's the second question. What can I do today to prepare for heaven? That's really what I wanted to kind of talk about tonight is uh, if, we're, if we're going to set our mind on heaven, we really need to investigate what we do on a daily basis and how that is working to prepare us for heaven. Here's a, a, another teaching from Christ about the end times. This is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, 28 through 37. Jesus says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Now, certainly part of heaven is understanding that at any moment, we could be called to heaven, whether it's through our own death or the return of Christ. And since he's teaching on his return and the end times, he gives us some instructions. And I think this is a really good outline about, of how we should be approaching now in light of heaven, how we should really, really be using now to prepare for heaven. And before I get into <clears throat> unpacking this text, I just read to you a passage from Hebrews but I, one thing I wanted to point out that I forgot about <coughs> is right here. It says, But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Even then, in the first century, the Holy Word of God is calling that the end of the ages. Right? That's, that's the equivalent of Jesus saying we are already in the last days. Here's another biblical writer verifying the same information that even then, we were close to the end. And so, all the more, all these years later through Christian history, the church history, you know, we are on the, the doorstep. All right, let's talk about this, this advice from Jesus about what we should be doing as we wait his return or as we uh, prepare for heaven. He ends this passage by saying, Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Now this is like direct evidence that we don't have an excuse for like ignoring these things in our life or not talking about these things. Remember when we began back two weeks ago or so, I, I said, you know, people either are sensationalist about these things or they avoid them altogether because they're uncomfortable talking about them. And maybe that's because of some of the abuses that have happened in, throughout church history. But Jesus himself says, watch, 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 I mean, over and over. So we're going to talk about what that looks like. First, let's talk about what it means to take heed. The dictionary says things like listen, hear, focus, concentrate, pay attention, or direct your attention to something. And what Jesus is saying is listen carefully and listen well. This is important, and you need to act upon it. Listening requires attention and devotion. Uh, if you're not listening, if you're not giving him your attention, then you're not going to hear what he has to say. And if you don't love him or we could say respect his authority, you're not going to pay attention either. So what I have here on this, the third bullet is obedience requires faith and recognition of his authority. Not only do you have to believe that he said it and it's true, you also have to believe that he is the Lord and this is unprecedented authority. No one has more authority than him. 
Now, if uh, the chief of police came in here and gave us uh, an order, uh, we would probably listen up, right? He's 30 years in. I, don't, I haven't met the new chief of police in Mint Hill yet, but the, the bottom line is we respect authority when we see it. If, uh, if I'm in the Air Force and a one-star general walks in the room or a colonel like we have here tonight, you know, that's, that commands attention immediately. In fact, it changes the way we even approach the distinguished visitor's arrival, right? There's a parking space prepared. There's like all this protocol that we go through preparing for someone of authority. Well, you know, I often say this, but how many stars are on the Lord's uniform? You know, the, the point is, uh, the old adage is if, if, the, if the president was showing up at your church, you'd wear your best, but the Lord himself shows up there every Sunday, you know, you ought to act like it and live like it. So, uh, take heed really means, I think, listen to what I'm saying, and the urgency of what he's saying, it really comes across to me as a message of vigilance. And it really means that we're never off duty. You know, there's no such thing as retirement in following Christ. Uh, there's a, a really good book uh, by John Piper called Don't Waste Your Life. And he describes two families, and I may have shared this with you guys. It's hard for me to keep track of all the things that I, anecdotes and stuff that I share, but he compares two families. And one successful middle class family, kids are gone, and they were very smart financially, and they retire at 59, and they're just living it up in Florida, golfing all the time. And then there's this, these two elderly, 80 year old widows that are in, uh, I think it's uh, Guatemala or some uh, South American, Central American country on mission, okay? Now, the, the older couple, the older ladies, they're not a couple, they're just friends and missionary partners, they uh, get in trouble with some of the locals in an attempt to get away, they drive off a cliff and die. And his question in the book, Don't Waste Your Life, is which one is the greater tragedy? The couple in Florida at 60, spending the next good 20 years of their life not serving the King of Kings but themselves, or these 80-year-olds who went off the cliff and went on to glory? It's a very, very powerful illustration. And it's, uh, it's caused a lot of young men uh, to think about their life and go into the ministry. This is, he wrote this book maybe 20, 25 years ago, I think. Anyway, the point is uh, we have to take heed and have vigilance. Uh, and remember what the text says. He says in the parable, because he throws in a parable, right? He says, imagine that the master goes away, and there's two things. He gives you authority, and he gives you work to do, right? And your, your job is to be on watch as well. So we're going to think about those things as we think about what we're doing to prepare for heaven now. Take heed is the first. The second is the watch. And I think this is really like vigilant faith. And I think this really meets us where we are right now, especially if you watch the news. With our minds set on heaven, we are on guard against distraction and deception. Here's a quote from a commentator, Rodney Cooper. Listen to this. All believers in every age must watch. Jesus exhorted all believers not only to keep watch for his return, but also to watch out so nobody would deceive them and rob the house. Temptations and pressures would come, causing troubles and despairs. Or despair. His followers were to watch out for these things as well. Do not let anything derail you from your task of preaching the gospel and remaining steadfast, he encouraged. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. He's basically commenting on the text that we've looked at and he's trying to unpack what all Jesus meant when he was commanding us to be on watch. It also requires belief. So I said vigilant faith, that's kind of like continuous uh, faith and continually being on guard against deception, false teaching, uh, or temptation. But it also is belief and sometimes this is what happens. We we have an intellectual knowledge, but we don't have uh, the belief behind it. And so what, I'm, what I have here is with our mindset on heaven, we are not distracted or discouraged too much by worldly affairs. 
And I love this. John Bloom, in an article right, uh, called Don't Let Discouragement Choke You, he says, when we feel discouraged, we want comfort, which is right to feel. But the comforts we often turn to are ways to avoid our fears rather than ways to muster our courage to face and overcome them. When this happens, discouragement simply becomes sinful indulgence in unbelief. No different than indulging in lust or anger or other sins of unbelief. Now, we might not be thinking about it that way. But all sin comes from a lack of faith. And you can look at Romans 14, 23. But what he's saying there is if, if you're tempted because of fear, not trusting God, to run to something else in your discouragement to try to appease you, then basically you're facilitating your unbelief. You're not facing the fear and letting it drive you to the Lord, who actually is sovereign over those things, right? Uh, Charles Spurgeon said there's not a blade of grass on the whole planet that can move without his permission. The Bible is filled with language about him being in control of the snow, the lightning, the clouds, etc. I mean, if he, if he knows when a bird dies, if he attends the funeral of every bird that drops from the sky, if he is responsible for feeding every sparrow, Jesus is not lying to you. He's saying that his father is actually that involved in every detail of the world. And so I think his point is really convicting. It's like sometimes rather than dealing with our unbelief and our fear, when Jesus says, peace unto you, don't let your heart be troubled, do not fear, right? Do not worry, I got this, I'm with you, you know, over and over and over and over and over. In fact, don't, doesn't it seem even like he gets a little bit aggravated with the disciples at times? It's like, oh, you have little faith. Or, I haven't met anyone in Israel with this kind of faith, right? He says it over and over. He's like, how long must I be with you people, is what he says. Without sinning, holy God... Is, is, is showing that in our sinful disposition, we are so prone to get back to unbelief, to not trusting. And so I think this is something, especially now, you can watch the news, you can get upset about what you like about, or what you don't like about the country, or where it's going, or this issue, or that issue. And, um, you know, sometimes you just have to trust that God knows exactly what he's doing, in what's happening. And... You don't have to understand it. I don't pretend to understand it all, but I trust that even when things happen that I don't like, he uses them towards his will in my life. And so I, I have to believe that principle on a universal perspective, right? Uh, don't forget, it was God who was pursuing us, right? He could have just stepped back, barred it up, threw it away, started over, made a million more if he wanted to. He pursued us. He pursued Adam and Eve in the garden. So sometimes we just, you know, I think we get our minds too fixed on worldly affairs. And don't get me wrong, there is, there is this Christian responsibility to be an engaged citizen. Okay? I'm not trying to tell you that you are supposed to be so heavenly minded that you know it's not good. I'm, I'm telling you to keep it all in balance. Right? Keep it in perspective. God is sovereign. And uh, if you read Revelation you know that nothing is hunky-dory in the end, right? There is no utopia. It's really bad. And our hope is that the Lord will rapture the church before it gets to that point. I read a story about uh, D.L. Moody. This is a story he shared, actually. Uh, a man was uh, clean, moving his library from upstairs to downstairs. And um, his little son was really excited and wanted to help him. And so he said, okay, uh, all you gotta do is grab some books, carry them downstairs to the other room. Well, he, the man comes back up the stairs a few minutes later and he finds his son like struggling with this huge book, like the biggest book in the room. And he's so discouraged, he just starts crying on, this, on the stairs. And so the, the man picks him up and the book. And takes him upstairs and comforts him. And D.L. Moody said, what a wonderful picture of a God who can take your, your concerns and your trials and your troubles. He has no problem picking you up and that problem, right? He would, he would just take care of it, which uh, I think he quoted um, 
Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest. You know, I get aggravated with myself sometimes. Like, why am I so prone to think that I can figure it out anyway? You know, when I have anxiety and discouragement and fear and worry, when, my, when, I, when I get out in front of my feet, when I stop depending on the Lord for everything every day, then I know, warning, warning, you've decided to trust in yourself and you're inadequate, so you need to get back to, to where you know you can depend. And, of course, that's the Lord Jesus. I love this. This is so relevant for today in the church. Psalms 37, 1 through 9. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, of sin. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Isn't that an amazing passage right now <laughs> in, the, in the times that we live in? You know, I read a... Um, I don't know who I was listening to. I, was list- I listened to a lot of preaching and BBN and other things. And um, it was a sermon, and it was about the demoniacs that Jesus encountered. And it was the, the ones that were chained up to the wall, and they were outcast, and no one could handle them. And the, the pastor said, do you think for one minute that Jesus was uh, intimidated or it was a challenge to him? to deal with the demonic. Not at all. Like, it's a nuisance. It's not even a problem, right? And so, you know, we in fear can think, oh my goodness, you know, we know we're outpowered in the spiritual realm. But not Jesus, not the Lord. And in fact, they beg him, right? Oh, son of God, please don't throw us in the abyss. It's not a big deal to Jesus. He's got it. He's got it all. He's got all of the evil in control, in his permissive will, and he's going to use it for ultimately his sovereign purposes. And so um, it doesn't mean that we're robots and that we're, uh, you know, we don't have feelings. It doesn't mean that, that we should be stoic and, and, and inhuman. Yeah, you're going to have times of weariness. You're going to have times that you're weeping and that's when we're supposed to be there for each other and he's always there for us but ultimately we know that our weeping is going to only endure for the night right and the morning's going to bring joy and it's going to be joy forever i mean at his right hand are pleasures forevermore right so all it takes in discouragement is to get your mind back on these things and trust 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 is so huge Trust that it's true. Trust that it's real. Trust that it will come to pass. I love Psalms 135, verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. This is a God who can command a big fish to show up where He wants it. Or a pile of fish to show up on the specific side of the boat that He wants them to. He can do anything He wants to. In your life, in my life, in the church, I think sometimes we experience frustration because we're trying to do it without Him. We're trying to do too much when we can set back and really uh, enjoy the comfort of being in His arms. And, and it's not just about will and strength, which ours always fails. It's about His wisdom. He knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly what the world needs. Uh, and so... I think sometimes it's easier for us to um, acknowledge our limits physically without really understanding our limits mentally or in knowledge. And, and of course, he's omniscient. He knows it all. So food for thought. So take heed, watch, and pray. 
Uh, battles have been won or lost based on communication abilities. Here's a picture of a World War, World War II radio operator. And, uh, you know, you don't have to look through military history hardly at all before you realize that some of the greatest battles in history occurred because of either good communication, they were won, or they were lost because of bad communication. With our minds set on heaven, we are regularly in contact with our commander and ready to receive his orders. Listen to this. This is from a book called The Battle Plan for Prayer. I like it. When prayer becomes your immediate reflex instead of your last resort, the whole battlefield begins to tilt in your direction. I like that so much. That, that's, in essence, kind of the outflowing of that kind of faith. When you know God's got it, and you know He's available to you, and you know you can rest on Him, and you know He's always there, you can always pour out your heart to Him, and that connects you to heaven. It connects you to the commander. It connects you to the mission. It connects you to the reality that Christ is already there. And I just think that's a, a wonderful way that the Lord allows us to participate in His will. We get to participate in what's going on in heaven because, as the Bible teaches, that our prayers ascend to heaven and are really fragrant smells to his nostrils, is what, how the Bible communicates it. So the more we connect to heaven through prayer, the more we are reminded that our commander is in control and ready, um, and, and be ready for his orders, I should say. All right, so a little more about prayer. It's really about communing and interceding and listening and obeying. And there's a lot of ways we do that, but I think the way God's designed it, and you have to think about Him outside of this, deciding to set it up this way, which is just a huge statement about His sovereignty in the first place. He's the one that designed this system where we talk to Him through prayer and we read about Him through Scripture and the Holy Spirit interprets it in our heart. He has designed it this way so that when we seek Him, we will get our minds back on Him and His power. And that will really like replenish us. It will remind us about the true state of affairs. And of course, the longer you're disconnected from him, the more you start leaning on your own ability and the more despair you start to produce in yourself because you get that you don't have enough. And you know, that's really a great way to think about our struggles in life is apart from the Lord and for those who don't have faith, you know, you've heard this a million times from other Christians. I don't know how people do it. I try to remember, like, what it was like when I was wavered and not living for the Lord, not sold out and surrendered to Him. And, you know, it really was just this perpetual weariness of transferring my hope from one artificial thing to another artificial thing to another artificial thing. And it was always dissatisfying. It was always... Uh, inefficient, insufficient. And so, you know, there's a lot of people out there and they have a heart that, you know, is somewhat hardened. They don't think they need God. But the truth is, in their soul, they know that they're not getting the kind of comfort that they need. And so they're going on from one thing to the next, trying to manufacture it themselves. We looked at Isaiah 55, 6, and 7 uh, a couple of weeks ago, but I like the urgency of this. He says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And that's just a wonderful uh, invitation for uh, all of us to just go before him and seek him. And, and, you know, it really makes me sad when I think about people who, they aren't seeking him now, and then there's going to be a day when they won't be able to seek him at all. I mean, if you really want to define what hell is, it is permanent separation from God. There will be no opportunity. Actually, right now, they actually have an opportunity to, to seek him. All right, third question. How can I experience heaven today? Well, I, I think really we can just by applying the principles that we've already talked about. Take heed is exercising your faith. 
watching is hopeful expectation, right? Uh, hope in the Bible is not this, I hope it happens, like improbability, like pulling a slot machine kind of thing. It's like, um, I'm certain it's going to happen, right? And then, of course, when we pray, I, I put their love, thinking of Paul, you know, he talks about uh, faith, hope, and, and charity, love. The, the greatest of these is love. I think prayer communicates love because it's, it's suggestive of a heart that knows they need God, depends on God, appreciates God. Um, now, now, we know that when we're young or immature in the faith, we can ask God for things, uh, but usually that's short-lived for a non-believer or a person of, uh, you know, really a carnal Christian. Because as soon as things don't go the way they think they should, they get frustrated with God. And that shows that they were really all about, they were there for themselves. They weren't necessarily there for, for Him. Of course, when we, when we realize who He is, and we begin to be enamored with His beauty, we're the ones that start benefiting from that. It's, it's another paradox. It's just like the, the paradox of, wow, I get so much fulfillment when I start to think about others and do nice things for others and serve others. I used to think it was all about me, 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 and getting it my way and getting what I want, but that left me dissatisfied. Uh, in a real way, we, we run very, uh, you know, against the current of the world, counterclockwise, so to speak. Every day is an opportunity to experience communion with God in heaven, the peace of Christ ruling our hearts, and His love that ensures our home in heaven. So, here's the last question, or I have... One more after this. Do I treasure the kingdom of heaven? Now, this is a question about priorities. And what made me think of this is some of Jesus' parables on the kingdom of heaven. Specifically, he calls it the kingdom of heaven, right? So, the question is really, are we willing to give up everything else to have God? And I think, uh, you think of the, the young, rich young ruler who you know, approached Christ, and he said, I'm a moral man, basically. I follow all the scriptures. I follow all the law. And Jesus saw his heart and knew what his problem was, knew what his faults God was, and says, go sell all your possessions. Now, I don't believe he was trying to teach us that we should all take a vow of poverty and, and you know, that you can't be rewarded for hard work and you should just give away everything you have. Now, the, the first century church certainly put everything in the pot. Okay, we can't deny that. They put everything in the middle and they distributed it equally. It's a wonderful thing. But, but his point was, there's something that you're not willing to give up for me. And when Jesus constantly says we have to die to ourselves, right? When he constantly says that, you know, a, a, a seed has to die before it can bear fruit. He always has given us this image that you've got to get to the end of yourself and you've got to be willing to give up everything for Him and then He rewards you with more than you could ever get on your own. I mean, it's just amazing how it works. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. It's about a priority of, you know, if... If it was just so-so, maybe I'll sell half of my stuff, you know? If I thought it was inadequate, I wouldn't justify sacrificing for it. But if I have an idea of just how valuable it is, just what a treasure it is, I'll be willing to sacrifice everything. And that's why Paul was willing to get bitten by asp and shipwrecked and beaten and flogged and imprisoned, etc. It's because he got a chance to get caught up in the third heaven. Not only did he see Jesus on the road to Damascus, he got a vision of heaven itself. He knew it was worth it, just for the Lord, number one. Number two, he got a sense of, of what it would be like in this kingdom of heaven. And he, he said, all of that, all of my life, all of these accomplishments, all this stuff is rubbish compared to the eternal weight of glory. And he talks about pressing on to the prize that awaits us in Christ Jesus. So, I think that's what we have to ask ourselves on a daily basis. And I think it's kind of easy to say, oh yeah, yeah, God's, God's, yep. But we need to start digging deeper. 
when you start asking more specific questions. What is my life, my time, my calendar, my words, my relationships, what do they show that I'm treasuring? And of course, we all have room to grow, and that's the perfect opportunity to seek the Lord for help. So, Here's uh, some great passages. 1 Peter 1, 3-5 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now there's so much there. It's a living hope because Christ is alive and he conquered the grave. It's real, it's certain. And it's an inheritance, an inheritance that doesn't corrupt, it's not defiled, it's holy, and it's permanent, it never goes away. And it's reserved for who? For you and me. And we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Uh, go home tonight and read Jude 24 and 25, and you'll see that same language that uh, he who called you will keep you, and he will present you before the Father with blameless, with great joy. It's just a, one of the most beautiful benedictions in the Bible, but it describes how God's involved. I mean, when, when the Bible says Jesus is the, the author and the finisher of your faith, you see that, that author means he's pursuing you, and that finisher means he keeps you. He ultimately presents you before the Father. Nobody's going to get in heaven and say, Ah, oh, yeah, 99.9% .9 was Jesus, but that, there's that one part that was me. God's not sharing his glory like that. We benefit from him getting all the glory. And so I don't think we're going to get to heaven, and it's going to be like, Good job, you made that one choice, and it's all up to you. You saved yourself, you made the right choice. So, it's food for thought, and I understand it can get complicated. I don't try to go too far. I, I think there's complex mysteries in the Bible that belong to the Lord. If I have any inclination that I can figure him out, I am just admitting how much of an ignoramus I am. So I just try not to push farther than the, the Bible. Here's some more. Psalm 1611, I already quoted some of it. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And then one we all know really well. John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. Praise the Lord Jesus. All right, next week we're going to focus on what to expect when we arrive in heaven. And I hope that that'll be a, a good opportunity to get some of those um, wild questions that we have about heaven answered. I'm going to try to come prepared with a lot of resources. Um, I left the book in the car. Here, I'll show you. I can show you right here. I don't know how well you can see that, but that's not really well, not well at all. A little better. That's the book. Um, now, the, this is actually the guide to it. There's all kinds of supplemental material to it. But if you really want to, um, to look at an in-depth study of heaven, uh, this book, Heaven, is it, just wonderful. He sold over a million copies. Uh, he also has one on happiness. What, what these really are are what we call biblical theologies. In other words, you take a topic and you look throughout the whole Bible and you find out what the whole Bible says about a subject. 
And he's done a really good job giving a really comprehensive picture from beginning to end about what the Bible actually communicates about heaven. And sometimes it, it challenges your paradigm. It actually helps you understand some things that uh, you might not have known before. Um, particularly with happiness, he does this. So for example, he says, do you think God's grumpy? Do you think God's miserable? Do you think he's sitting there worried? Or do you think he's delightful and absolutely joyful and absolutely pleasant? Like, we have this idea of the Old Testament wrathful God, but in Christ, we, even, even outside of our own relationship with God, God is absolutely satisfied with him, within himself, right? And so the Bible talks about blessed be the gospel of, of the blessed God, I think it's in Timothy. And blessed means happy, happy God. So anyway, a whole other book to look at from Randy Alcorn. He's a great, great writer. Anybody have any questions about any of this tonight? Three weeks ago, we talked about, you know, where are we? Are we living in the last days? Last week, we talked about setting our mind on heaven. Tonight, specifically, we, we talked about how to, how to prepare for heaven, what, what Jesus wants us to do while we serve him. Um, I want to say one more thing about that, and then I'll, I'll pray. We have church council tonight, so we're going to end, uh, end a little early. There are divine appointments for your life. Works that God prepared before the foundation of the world for you to do. He planned the timing. He planned the gifting that you have to be there. He planned the glory that you're going to give Him and the reward that you'll receive for them. Like If we could wake up and just push back this, the flesh and get down off our high horse and in front of the Lord and say, I'm available, I'm ready for whatever you prepared for me today. I think our lives would have so much more purpose and we, would, we wouldn't be so myopic. Sometimes we get our minds on ourselves and it stays there all day. And uh, it's like Corey Ten Boom said, if, if, you, if you look within, you're going to be dis- depressed. If you look without, you're going to be distressed. But if you look in heaven, you're going to be blessed. And that is so true. What a, a remarkable woman she is. And um, now that she's with the Lord. Another way that she says it, I think that's very powerful, is, is her illustration with the, um, is it, is it the, the stitching, the needle. She basically, uh, she shows the back of a cross stitch, right? And it's just a bunch of mangled threads, all different colors, and it's just a mess, right? And she flips it over, and it's like this beautiful picture of something. I can't remember what it is. And she's like, life might feel like the back side of this, but this is what God, God is doing. He, he's weaving something in your life that's going to stand forever. And uh, th- those things get excite, excite me. They motivate me. Uh, they motivate me to endure when things are hard. And... Um, they certainly uh, incentivize me to continue to try to live a holy life instead of falling for the, the traps of the world. So I hope they'll help you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise you tonight. We thank you so much for who you are. Oh Lord, all our hearts have a multiple things that we are concerned about, worried about, burdened about. But Lord, right now we lift them up to you. We're like that child on the stairs upset and in despair because we can't lift this burden, but this burden is nothing for you. In fact, the Bible teaches us that nothing is too hard for you. Nothing can thwart your plan. Nothing's impossible for you. So, Father, we are weary and heavy laden in ways, and right now we ask you to take it from us. Give us rest, Lord, in you, knowing that your arms are mighty, your shoulders are broad enough for anything. And Lord, that's just such a comfort to know that we have you, that we can rest in your arms in many ways. Some of the beautiful language of Scripture comes to my mind, like a hen covering her eggs or her hatchlings. Um, Lord, you've got it. And we praise you for that. Lord, build our faith. Help us to grow deeper, trusting you more. Uh, forgive us for those times that we doubt in unbelief. Uh, help us to be steadfast, to take heed.
to what you say and to watch at what you're up to in the world. The enemy may be causing all kinds of chaos, but he's not stopping your Holy Spirit one second. Lord, and help us to seek you, pray, intercede, to commune with you. Lord, you know our lives get busy, and before we know it, we, we can get off track. So we just thank you that we can stop and pause midweek and return to you and get our minds focused back on you. Lord, one day that would not be a problem at all for us, and I am looking forward to that day. Father, thank you for the promise of heaven, for the, the opportunity to enjoy the beauty of your holiness forever. Uh, thank you that you're gracious and your pardon is just you know, amazing. It, it's just incredible, the type of mercy that you've shown us. And not only the forgiveness of sins and saving us from your wrath or judgment, but to inherit us as your children and to make us heirs to your kingdom, to prepare an inheritance for us that is just better than anything we've ever experienced in this life. It's just so much, Lord. How can we not just glorify your name and worship you? Lord, we thank you for tonight. Pray for everyone in here. Certainly pray for those in our church family. I think of a bunch of names, a lot of people who are hurting, some people who are going through some, some scary diagnoses or, or some scary doctor visits. Uh, there's, there's difficulties in relationships and, and trouble at work, and there's just all kinds of situations, Lord. Father, tonight we pray that all of your people here at Idaho would take these cares to you, cast their cares on you because you care for us. Father, thank you for the chance to be together tonight. Bless our church council. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.